Welcome, Investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared with All Things Crime. Welcome to episode three of our discussion with Detective Steve Connor from the Roar PD. Enjoy. So what was it like when you got that hit? That's interesting because uh, I was at home. I was watching TV with my wife and my boss calls. And the only thing he said was, we have a CODIS match on the Bennett case. And I go, yeah, yeah, but why are you really calling? And he goes, no, we, we do. <laughs> uh, and there's a meeting tomorrow, this conference room meeting with all these, you know, law enforcement celebrities. Um, and he goes, you're the last to know. And I thought that was kind of odd. He goes, I go, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, you are the last to know. Everybody else had the information to me. I said, oh, okay. And I didn't think too much of it at the time, but then when you look at the protocol involved, I mean, it was definitely different, but I get, I mean, I get the point. It was a high profile case. They wanted to keep the information under wraps for a while. Um, but I just thought it was interesting because the protocol is, if there's a match, I get an email with from CBI saying, here's a match, you need to go follow it up, you need to get DNA, you need to confirm, just a process. And I just, I, I still, I chuckle to this day. I think it was kind of funny. Well, of course, you know, you can't trust detectives with any kind of information. Or something like that, like right? that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's, um, detectives are, I, I've found, are kind of the catch-all, be-all types that, you know, you guys are either on the front lines or the last to Yeah, there's no in-between, yeah. Uh, of course, I, yeah, the the crime scene investigators I've found in in some agencies, uh, they never find out. In fact, I I was at one just last week that they they were like, well, you know, we just nobody ever gives us any feedback on any kind of performance, you know, how we do. I'm like, well, how do you know if you're collecting the blood correctly? You know, what what percentages of the hits are you getting? And they're like, I don't know. We we never get any feedback, and I'm just kind of like, well, <laughs> I well, guess that's our, our about. CBI or our CSI guys no. were the same way. They're asking us about cases. Hey, what's going on? And that's my same thought. Well, don't they keep it? No, no. We have to ask the detectives. Nobody tells us anything. Okay, so here and I get the information on the case. So. Yeah, yeah, which I think is actually a huge mistake. That it's the more I. I associate with departments, um, you know, and every department operates in a different way, uh, that some of them are, the, the crime scene investigators are intricately involved with the actual case, including, uh, you know, obviously the detective is going to be kind of the quarterback of, of everything, but the, the CSI is kind of the, the upfront, I mean, the line, if you will, and but those guys, they really have to kind of know the details of the case in order to collect the evidence accordingly. And if they don't, then they're just either just collecting everything, but then they can miss a lot of things. And I mean, the really astute ones, they'll be going through a crime scene and they'll kind of look at things and say, that just doesn't look right. You know, and then maybe then they're coordinating with the, the detectives and saying, you know, does that particular thing look right? But if they're if they're knowledgeable about the case, uh, at least as much knowledge as as the detective might have, then to me it just seems like the the evidence collection portion of it is a lot more effective. Which I'm sure you know, the better the evidence that's collected from the crime scene, uh, the better your case is going to be on the back end. And especially when it comes to the actual court and convictions. So it's, uh, but then again, there's, there's others that I guess it works where, you know, they just send the crime scene in and say, just process that, that place and, um, gather everything. And then we'll evaluate it later and figure out what to submit. But I don't know. It's, uh, 
I, I, it's that from the sounds of it, you guys are well, kind of it, in between. It depends that. because if I have a CSI tell me, well, that doesn't look right. Well, if it doesn't look right to you, I say take it. If it doesn't look right to you, take it. And they get, almost get that sense of relief where, um, and I had a, another case where um, uh, a female was stabbed to death, dumped in a trash can in an alley. There's blood. But one of the CSI says, well, this blood over here on this leaf from the tree is far enough away or it wasn't. Anyway, it caught their attention. And they're going, so again, the detective could have said, there's blood everywhere, you know, but they collected the leaf with the blood on it. That leaf with the blood on it led to identity of the suspect because it wasn't her blood. It was a guy's blood, a male a male dropped this blood here. So we're thinking, well, he stabbed her pretty good, so he must have cut himself. And it wasn't until, again, probably three, four, five years ago, um, when we started doing the genetic testing, because he wasn't, that blood DNA was not in CODIS. So again, expanding out beyond that, we went through a, a genetic genealogist to tell us who this is. So they gave us the family and we had a trip to uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Bismarck, and then some small town in Idaho before we resolved the case. Um, we collected DNA from the daughter of the person we thought it was, and we got that match that says, yeah, her dad is the one that killed this person over here. It was at the scene, you know, involved in dropping the blood on the leaf at that crime scene. But he had... He, so it was a yes. leaf that was mm -hmm. on the ground. So again, getting back to the astute oh, CSI goes, yeah, I don't think they said that no, doesn't look right. Hey, there's blood here. It's a drop and it's the body's over there. There's a, enough separation between the two to catch his curiosity. And they go, yeah, take it. And that was actually what led us to, you know, the guy we we're looking for. So, you know, like you think some, something small where I had another case where, um, they collected the entire apartment, the, the bedroom. It was, it was a one bedroom, so it wasn't that bad. Living room, dining room, uh, furniture. I mean, this whole room filled with, they could recreate the crime scene from what they took from it. The bed, the mattress, I mean, everything. So I had constantly had the property people going, you know, I got this box spring, this mattress, this dining room set, taking up too much space in the warehouse. What do you want us to do with it? I go, I can't destroy it. So anyway, I ended up peeling the, the mattress cover off and getting rid of the frame and all that. Um, but from there, I'm looking at what other evidence do I have? Well, some other CSI goes, I have this blood trail that went from the bedroom to the bathroom. It can't be his because he's dead here. Unless he cut himself over here, just dripped a little bit and then blood out over here. So they had taken swabs of different places. So I said, well, just pick a swab and we'll see if it's his. And they picked one. It's not his. Again, stabbing death. I'm going, that's my suspect. But that took probably another two years to figure out who he is because at the time, CBI would only enter evidence like that into the local database. And this guy had moved out of state like right after it happened. So... He remained, again, an unknown, never in CODIS. He's, I put the suspect's DNA in CODIS, never got a hit. And then they expanded it to the nationwide database and got a hit right away. Suspects in Maryland, fly back there, get his DNA, come back here. Yes, it's him. So, you know, it's just the technology's evolving. And it's our job in law enforcement to keep up with that. And a lot of times that technology is outside the scope of what your state lab can provide. So you're going to have to pay some money to get that done. And we didn't mind. I mean, we, we weren't funded for it, but if I asked for it, they didn't turn it down. By the way, um, I, I just interviewed, I mean, literally uh, a week ago, interviewed Clean Fitzpatrick. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of editing those those episodes right now so that's great she's anybody that she's great it's just so ironic yeah. that uh oh she's amazing isn't she I, mm -hmm. i'm just i'm sitting there talking to her and 
she's telling me all about, uh, you know, being a PhD in, in physics, uh, not only would she understand, yeah, understand the chemistry and the biology of DNA, but more importantly, understanding the statistics of it and kind of how to trace down what information is important and what isn't. And wow, boy, she's so, so far I've, I've heard specifically from like four different detectives, seasoned detectives that are from all over the country. I mean, one in, you know, like I said, Cloyd Steiger in Seattle and then Joe Kennedy, he's a, Joe. a cold case guy. He's retired. Oh, you know, Joe? Well, I don't know him personally. I, I know he does a lot of the uh, classroom oh. training. Um, yeah. When I was at the office, when I was working, his stuff would pop up and we'd communicate a, a couple of times, but I didn't ever met him. Oh, he's, he's amazing. Uh, he's, he started the cold case unit for NCIS. Right. And so, um, yeah, I was able to solve cases all over the world, but then when he retired, uh, he started some, uh, cold case specific things in North Carolina, but it, I think that's kind of blossomed out to, anyway, I, I mean, he's, he's involved with a number of cold case societies and things like that. Right. So smart guy. Yeah. Yeah. But then, uh, um, yeah, but to hear Colleen from you as well, and um, yeah, she's uh, she's in high demand. She uh, did a conference out in Las Vegas. I got to go to. I had been like probably two years talking, emailing, and never met her. And I got a chance to go to this conference. So I said, "Yeah, yeah, I got a chance to go to this conference." She goes, "Great, I am too." So we hooked up out there and got to know each other. And then she did the last one of the last. Um, breakout sessions in the seminar. Um, I had to leave a little early because if I didn't, I'd miss my flight, but uh, I had a great time out there. She is very smart. Yeah. Yeah. Very smart. So, and she was kind of like you. Uh, it took me a long time to get, uh, <laughs> be able to get her on just because she's so busy. And, but you know, forensics genealogy is kind of like, you know, we're talking about technology. It's, um, man, especially once the Golden State Killer was was captured using that forensics genealogy. It's uh, it's amazing just because it's one thing when you have, like you said, the blood on the leaf and that is physical evidence and gathering that stuff and then being able to actually develop a, a good fingerprint or a DNA profile or something like that. That's one level. And those that that can generate a bunch of leads based on the databases that you have. But if that person, like you said, isn't in the database in order to compare it to, then uh, it's it's just fantastic that this forensics genealogy has come through that now you can actually narrow it down and at least find. Uh, you know, narrow it down from a thousand suspects to say six because you have the family tree. Well, it's interesting because you know. um, the ones that we used on, we narrowed it down to the suspect. Not to, I mean, we uh, they did the tree, but then it's like, yeah, we're kind of looking at this guy. When we went up to North Dakota, the, um, the person we first contacted said, oh yeah, I've done my ancestry research. And he brings out this big book and he's going through the history. And I'm going, that's amazing. So basically, and we go, Okay, amidst your family here, who would be the most likely to kill somebody? And the husband and wife goes, this guy. <laughs> so uh, so I go, where is he? Well, he and, it, and that turned out to be Alex Ewing? No, Ewing? no, no, that's a different case. Alex is a 1940, this was a 1995 case where the girl was dumped in, in the alley, the bloody leaf. Um, Oh, okay. So I go, okay, we'd like to contact him. Well, he's, he's been deceased since 2004 or something like that. Okay. Have any uh, brothers or sister law on the uncle or on the cousin? They go, he goes, but they do have, he did have a daughter in Idaho. So, but he also has a, I think his sister lived out in Bismarck. So we drove out there and talked to her. Um, I think we got her DNA and then we went to Idaho a couple of weeks after that, which was the most direct source to the suspect. And, uh, we used, um, a company out here called United Data Connect and you can go online research and they've done a fabulous job out here solving cases for us. Um, 
we started this again dates when you're retired dates are meaningless anymore but um probably in 2016 17 somewhere in there we i formed a coalition of sorts between united data connect uh the aurora police department and the metro denver crime stoppers and we had sat and talked because metro denver crime stoppers offers these rewards for information leading to the arrest conviction of persons involved in these specific crimes and they lay them out so it was asked of uh mike mills who's the president of metro denver crime stoppers why can't you pull that money in not use it for a reward getting someone to talk which is sometimes impossible and fund a program over here that does the forensic genetic research on the DNA we have to see if we can't locate them that way because you'll be spending about as much on the reward as you would this way and I think they've solved I don't know say 15 20 cases already themselves so I mean doing an, an awesome job and it's being it's a, a program that's being funded basically by the contributions of the people. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think society in general is kind of tired of seeing so many cases. And I well, I, I've I've thrown the the number of homicides that are cold cases out a number of times, and I think it's up to around two hundred thirty thousand that's in the national database now that are cold cases and uh most people have no idea you know that there's potentially 200,000 plus uh unconvicted or or uncaught you know murderers out there that are walking amongst us and i i i think people are tired of seeing billions if not trillions of dollars being spent in Washington and yet simple programs like what you're talking about are go almost completely unfunded and then so people just get tired of it and they say well you know what uh there's enough wealthy individuals or, or even people with a little bit of means uh out here let's uh let's combine forces and and get something like this funded i'm not a huge fan of federal funding because it's kind of hit and miss you put in for the money you get or you don't it's like nothing in between um, I think programs like this should be grassroots level, not from a, you know, faraway land to hope that Congress or whoever will approve your money for your purpose. So the fundraising here, the, uh, I guess, making the people aware through classes, hey, this is what we do. This is how we do it. We are not 100% successful but we are successful um, to, to be able to solve any number of, you know, even more than two or three in a specific jurisdiction. I'll give you an example of one. There was uh, Greenwood Village had a homicide and I don't know the specific details on that. I know it went unsolved for a long time. One homicide, no, I'm sorry, Cherry Hills Village, not Greenwood Village, Cherry, Cherry Hills Village had a homicide that went unsolved for like 25, 30 years. Nobody, I mean, not a clue. And I know it agitated the chief of police because I have one unsolved case in my city and nobody can seem to solve it. So this program was presented to them. You know, it's funded. All you have to do is do, you have CBI do the extraction, we'll do the sequencing, and we'll see if we can't find this guy. Sure enough, they found him, I think, in Nebraska. Uh, ultimately arrested him, charged him. I, I believe either was convicted or confessed. Again, I, there's so many of them that are being resolved. They can't keep track of conviction, death, you know, uh, confession, any of that. So, you know, when you have something like that begins to steamroll and people take notice, they don't care about the money in, in Washington because they may not get it, but they have a source locally that they can almost count on. And the investment comes from the community it doesn't come from taxpayers again in a faraway land so i'm pretty excited about this one um metro denver crime stoppers has been around for a while and they are i think the only one in this country so far i could be wrong 
that actually fund a program like this where instead of offering a reward for information that may or may not be called in, let's start actually investigating it by funding the research to find out who, at least whose family, this suspect is from and then drill it down from there. So it, it's been a very, a very good relationship for the past several years. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, so last thing that I really want to um, throw at you. So, and and maybe you don't know this, the answer to this question, but it, it's kind of, um, as a, what do you, I mean, you were, you were in homicide how many years? Just under 15, 14 years, like 11 months. Okay. Well, that's a long time. Yes. Um, what do you think are the best um, characteristics or, I mean, what, what does it take really to be a good homicide detective? That's a good question. Um, because when I went into homicide, I didn't even know myself. Um, I think other people being aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it, because they came to me when the position opened up, I didn't go to them. So they had a, a pool that they could draw from, but they went out looking for the people they wanted that they thought would be the, the best use of talent and skill for the position there. When I started working homicide, and actually even after I left, I thought, I am the least of these. These guys are so much smarter than me. Um, the only thing I had in my advantage was I lived that era. They have to research the era to figure out how things were done. Uh, but they, everyone in that unit that I worked with were my go-to people when it came to technology, except for the DNA aspect of it. I mean, the technology's advances isn't strictly with DNA or fingerprints. It's with <clears throat> starting out handwriting reports on UCR paper that the last copy's never legible and having those reports filed in the record system and then moving forward to, okay, now you have to type your reports. I don't know how to type. Well, learn. Self-taught, I'm typing, especially homicide reports. We want to be able to read your report as well as everybody else's report on the last copy of that paper. So, okay, so I'm trying to learn how to type. And then all of a sudden you have the, the advent of computers. We had, when I first started in Aurora, I mean, to their credit, they were the only con the only department in the state that had mobilely mounted computers in the car, limited. You could send messages to and from any place that was connected to the network. You could add notes to a call to where you didn't have to do a report and it would download it in records. So you have this book at the end that have all the, everything printed out on it. And then that advances into uh, being able to type your reports on the laptop and then send it off and it goes to records and it gets transcribed into their database. And there's even, you know, upgraded advancements on that to where I believe that if I was out on the road now, I don't know that I'd be able to do the job because of all the technology that is on board in the car. In addition to, oh yeah, they've got the, um, uh, whatever, I even forgot the name of them, the cameras, the body-worn cameras. So they have body-worn cameras now that sees more probably than you do because you're focused on whatever you need to focus on. This camera doesn't care and it's focused on whatever. Wherever you're moving, it's focused on. And then having that as part of your evidence too. So you have digital evidence from dispatch, digital evidence from your uh, body-worn camera. When I first started, they had digital evidence on reel-to-reel -reel tapes, these big spools of magnetic tape that every call that came in was recorded on that. And they, after 30 days, they would just re record over them if nobody wanted any information off of them. Uh, so you have development of technology in, you know, the cold, sterile environment of computers and, and that, as well as the, you know, the what makes me me is now available to the world. So, yeah, and it's yeah. constantly moving. Well, 
as you're talking, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how many listeners right now have no idea what they're, what you're talking about when you have the, the multi-layered, you know, carbon copies hey, <laughs> that you're trying to write through it. <laughs> you don't even know what a typewriter is. I mean, when, yeah. when I started with a manual yeah. typewriter, then they upgraded to electric typewriters. I think, wow, this is cool. But if you make a mistake, right. what do you do? You have the little white out that you have to put in there or the correction tape. But if you have three copies, you have to go through three. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was, wasn't worth it to me. <laughs> and then all of that stuff is actually uh, in paper form, physically filed somewhere. And uh, sometimes it gets misfiled. Oh, and, that's a and nightmare. Yes. Forever, so. so, but our, our files, <laughs> our cold case files were, were in a room. There were, if I counted correctly, there was 50, over 1,500 three ring binders of our cold cases. Then they decided to expand the floor they were on and take away that wing that had all these binders in it. So we had to put them out in a storage shed out behind the police department. And if I needed to get a copy of the report or read, I had to go out with this key, just unlock it, go in and then figure out how it was filed in there and grab the report. Then one day I get there and the whole storage container is empty. And I'm, I'm going, oh, this is great. Somebody stole our, our cold cases. Well, a certain records supervisor decided that our detective copies are now their records copies because we had better notes and better reports than they did. So they had confiscated them all, put them into records. And I go, what are you going to do? With them? You know, it's like, uh, well, we're just going to yeah. keep them in here. Well, after a while, it was like, we need to get these digitized before the paper dissolves, you know, and flies away, you know, turns into dust. So we spent three, four years just digitizing all those reports. And I used uh, volunteers. I used students from universities. I tried doing one of these on my own, just scanning them in, make sure it's legible. And, you know, but you have, you know, thousand two thousand page report and you're going through and it's 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 a mental nightmare so we ended up, it took us like said about four yeah. years or so to get it done but i'm about 99 percent sure that 98 percent of the cold cases are in digital form now. so when i left i was fairly confident in that so i just like you can hit the computer punch a button the report is there well yeah that's the the concept of having to dig through a, a thousand page report without the search function <laughs> and those kind of things which it's, again it's yeah, a, the, the kids nowadays was, just have no idea <laughs> exactly because the original pdf forms from the first generation digitizing of the reports was more of a photo snapshot that would be scanned in so it said PDF, but it was actually an image, a photo image. So if you went to search for that document, you'd never find it because you can't search the photo image on a PDF. It's like, right. but yeah. that's all been corrected. Everything's, yeah. you can do, you can do that now. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure uh, some departments are good at that and I'm sure some are just not. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, but hopefully eventually that'll all get there. So. Well, Steve, I, uh, you know, talking to you guys, um, I, homicide detectives to me, I mean, everybody that's involved with the criminal investigation process, which is really what we're trying to explore here on this show is, uh, just a wealth of information. And I, I really appreciate, you know, everything, you know, you finally making time for us and coming on, but it's, um, uh, I, I could be talking to you all day about all these different cases that you've explored and, you know, like I said, 15 years of uh, uh, how many cases did you did you actually investigate? You know, it's got to be it's got to be. Uh, well, there ton, was, yeah, so. I mean, because you're working as a team, you help the other detectives, especially if you're on call with whatever they need to get done. So you're part of that case as well as, you know, this is my case. Um, I help with these, but these are my cases. Right. Well, I appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing some of those and, you know, as we as we go along. And frankly, as you if, if you think of a really interesting case that you think the listeners would would want to hear about, then 
definitely let me know and we'll we'll have you on again. Right. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.